So, imagine that you're unemployed and decide to do a bit of job hunting, come across this amazing ad on Craigslist. It's exactly what you've been looking for. So you call in, do an over the phone interview, and you're hired. Amazing, right? Well, when you go in to start your job and meet your new boss, imagine that you're taken hostage for months at a time, tortured, and finally murdered. Not a very nice picture, huh? Or a movie plot. In fact, this was the way that Herman Mudgett, aka H.H. H. Holmes, used to lure young women to his torturous murder castle in the late 19th century. So today, we're going to talk about Mr. Holmes and his murder castle. So, who was H.H. H. Holmes, and how did this whole murder castle thing come about? Well, born in 1861 to a very wealthy family, Holmes got an early start on his criminal leanings. He attended medical school at the University of Michigan. Now, where, while he was there, he concocted this scheme. What he would do was steal cadavers from the laboratory at the school, take them, disfigure them, mutilate them, and set them up in positions to where it looked like they had been in a horrific accident. Now, prior to all this, Holmes had gone out and taken an insurance policy out on this friend or family member of his, so-called. And when the authorities would find the body, he was the only one able to identify it and would also be the sole beneficiary of the life insurance policy. Pretty interesting. And this is how he made his money while he was in medical school. Now, after graduation, he decided that he was going to abandon Michigan. Now. Let's tell you that he was also married at the time to Clara Levering and had a son. So he abandoned Michigan and his family with over $12,000 from his last insurance fraud scheme and went to Chicago to work in a pharmacy and start a business. After moving to Chicago, Holmes decided to open an office posing as an inventor and shortly thereafter courted and married a Ms. Myrtle Belcamp who was the daughter of a wealthy businessman out of Wilmette, near Chicago. Well, a little bit of time went by, he had a daughter with Myrtle, and pretty quickly grew tired of her. Now remember, he's still married to his first wife during all of this. So he moved away from Wilmette, closer into the city of Chicago. Now, while he was in Chicago, he came across a drugstore called Dr. E.S. Holton's Pharmacy on 63rd Street in Englewood. All it took was a little bit of charm to convince the elderly owners to hire him as a pharmacist. Now, Mr. Holton was pretty sickly and died shortly after Holmes started working at the store. After he had died, he convinced Mrs. Holton to sell him the property as she couldn't care for it herself entirely. Strangely enough, after that, Mrs. Holton disappeared to California where she decided to spend the rest of her days. Or at least that's what Holmes told local customers who posed the question. Later on, he actually admitted to murdering her shortly after the purchase. In 1889, Holmes made a brief journey to Indiana where he pulled yet another scam, an insurance fraud this time, leaving him with a tidy little sump of money. Upon his return to Chicago, Holmes decided to purchase the empty lot across the way from the pharmacy. There he began construction on what was supposed to be a large hotel and um, set of apartments for the upcoming World's Fair in Chicago in 1893. Now Holmes hired several different construction crews to work on this huge structure that he was building, three stories. He would hire a crew, then fire them nearly a week after they had started working. And this was for good reason. He didn't want anyone to know the actual layout of the structure. And of course, Holmes didn't want to answer to what all those trapdoors, iron rooms, hidden passageways, and chutes had to do with a hotel. So. What was the murder castle, and how did Holmes manage to get his victims there? Well, after construction was completed, Holmes moved his pharmacy across the way into the first floor of the structure. He also put in a jewelry store, a candy store, and a restaurant, and this comprised the entire first level of the mansion. 
Now, what Holmes would do was he used employment ads in small town newspapers, hotel ads for the World's Fair in 1893, marriage ads marking himself as a wealthy businessman looking for a young wife, as well as a multitude of personal charm to lure victims back to this structure. So, what would happen is, um, after these people, usually almost always young women would come to the castle, Holmes would put them up in one of the rooms on the second floor, holding them hostage there, sometimes for months at a time, torturing them to make sure he had access to all of their valuable possessions, raping them until he finally decided that he was tired and wanted to dispose of the bodies. Now, all of this went on, but not before Holmes managed to take out a multitude of insurance policies on as many victims as possible, often using pseudonames. So, I will certainly think twice the next time I'm looking on Craigslist for a gig or anything like that. Uh, makes me want to be a little bit more wary. Thanks for joining me on our discussion of H.H. H. Holmes and the Murder Castle. Please rate my video, leave me any comments that you have, and don't forget to subscribe. We'll see you next time. After moving to Chicago, Holmes decided to open office. Oh, I'm gonna start over, open. Um, <clears throat> after construction was completed on the lot, it was a three-story building, and ha uh, crap, harms, harms, homes, rounds. Okay.